Well, welcome back. Um, we're going to be talking today about Jewish history, but not the content of Jewish history, that is what happened, because you're not going to do that in a one hour class anyways. Um, instead, we're going to be talking about, well, sort of three questions related to Jewish history that fit more in the philosophy of Jewish history. So the first question is, how do you find out what happened in the past? And there are different approaches to doing that. Uh, a second is, what do you then do with that information? How does it apply to your life? How does it change elements of Jewish life um, or even conceptual pieces? And then third, what's the meaning of this history? What lessons do we draw from it? And how does that inform our understanding of how the universe works and our place in it and so on? So there's really three layers. There's finding out what happened. There's what do we do with this information once we have it? And then there's what meanings or what lessons can we draw from it in a larger uh, picture? So to answer the first question of how we find out Jewish history, there's a really fascinating book written by a Jewish historian called Zachor, um, which is a book about memory, except he makes the point that what we are commanded to remember in the book of Deuteronomy over and over again, Zachor is one of the most common commandments in the Hebrew Bible, it's an imperative form of remember, didn't happen. <laughs> The Exodus from Egypt that archaeology suggests certainly didn't happen the way the Bible said it did. If there was any kind of Exodus, it was a band of slaves fleeing and it was much smaller scale and no wonders and all that's added on later. And part of the point that Yosef Haim Yerushalmi makes in Zahor is that people don't want academic history. People want the story. People are more interested in the myth. And so historically, Jews didn't create a kind of native academic style historian or historiographic tradition. The Greeks did something like that, yeah. vaguely. Herodotus, Thucydides, at least are trying to get at some kind of objective truth, as he says how they're framing it. But the Hebrews never did that because once they had lost their land, once their temple had been destroyed, they were in exile. And it's like a long intermission because the real history was happening when they were in their land with their temple and their God or their kingdom with their king. And if you don't have the kingdom, and you don't have the temple, then it's not the real history. So it's just the intermission until we get back there. Um, and that's why at the end of the Passover Seder, it would always say, rebuild the temple soon in our day, next year in Jerusalem. The hope was that we'll get back to real history, that real history is done with armies and territory and rulers. Um, so do they think there's real history now, Israel? Ah, so that's an interesting question. Well, the temple we, hasn't been really mm, depends on they have a kingdom. Animal. Yeah, they have a they have a state, right? And so there is some of that speculation in the religious Zionist uh, areas. Remember that the founders of the state of Israel though were secular Zionists, right. uh, but they also wanted the Jews to be a nation like other nations. And this is in the context of 19th century European nationalism. They wanted a state like the Ukrainians, like the Poles, like the Serbians did. Um, and they were willing to take similar measures that those peoples did to, to get their independence. Um, so there was a, a sense of the Jews becoming like other peoples, including making history and being in history, as opposed to being this ghost people. That was one of the framings that was used at one point, um, that the Jews were a ghost people, which scared people because they, they had a spirit that continued without a body. They needed a body, and that was, that was the land, that was the, um, the real part of history. Um, and, you know, the, the Christians and Muslims sort of agreed with that perspective because they were doing real history. They had kingdoms, they had armies, they were fighting, they, you know, they were doing the big picture stuff. Um, so the, the challenge that Yerushalmi points out is he's a Jewish historian, but what he's selling people aren't as interested in. They want the stories more than they want the actual um, history. And there's a famous example I've mentioned in this class before of a conservative rabbi about 20 years ago who was at his congregation's Passover Seder, and he said, almost as an aside, well, we all know the Exodus didn't really happen the way it says in the Haggadah and in the book of Exodus. What? <laughs> the congregation flipped out because how could he say that? And my favorite quote in the LA Times article about it was one member who said, did he have to say it during the Seder? <laughs> you know, couldn't he kind of keep it a secret <laughs> and say it, you know, in the adult ed class in the library three weeks before? But that's ruining Passover because I want the story. I want the myth. Um, and I don't want any kind of quibbling historian coming in and poking holes in it. Uh, a few years later, Wolpe wrote a very interesting uh, essay about this where he said, um, I don't look at the Bible 
for uh, historical accuracy. I look at the Bible for truth with a capital T. Mm -hmm. And he meant sort of a supernal, you know, ultimate uh, ethical, uh, supernatural kind of truth, uh, the, the founding mythology, but he doesn't see mythology as not true. Uh, it's just it resonates in a different way or operates on a different plane or something. Ways of getting around the fact that it didn't actually happen. And so some people would hear that Wolpe quote about historical accuracy and truth and say, wow, you know, it really resonates with them. But others who are more sort of academic, historically inclined, or just sort of tangible history inclined would say, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, it's not historical accuracy, but it's truth. It, it, either it happened or it didn't. Like, I want to know what really happened as best we can know. So there is one approach to finding out what happened in the Jewish past, and that is tradition. It's the myth. It's read the book and the book is right. Um, and the book being the Hebrew Bible or the accounts in the Talmud that sometimes interpret what happened in the Hebrew Bible or even add new stories to what happened in the Hebrew Bible, but it's all part of the, the tradition's approach to what happened. So if the tradition says that Abraham ate matzah in the spring, you say, okay. Even if, if you thought chronologically, Abraham is living a long time before that Exodus story from Egypt where they put the dough on their backs and it bakes and they, and that's why they eat the matzah. So why is he, well, Abraham's a good Jew. It's springtime, you eat matzah. It's ahistorical, but it's the tradition. And so you, yours is not to reason why, you, yours is but to accept what the tradition has told you about the past. Um, and even in a modern era, uh, where we don't simply imbibe what the tradition has told us, and we don't think that George Washington actually chopped down a cherry tree, there are those who take a stance of what they call second naivete, or a sort of willful make-believe of, well, we're going to act as if this is true. We want to, you know, inhabit the ideas and experiences of our ancestors, and so we're going to play the as-if game. And so we're not going to quibble with it historically. We'll use the past tense to talk about it as if it was really there. But, you know, in our sober moments, we know that it isn't really there. But we believe in the power of myth to bind peoples together, to transcend time. And we, we don't want to break that chain. And so we're going to continue without quibbling on the historical detail side. So some, are, some have a naive approach to tradition. Some have a sort of second naivete approach to tradition. But in either case, they're accepting the myth and saying the myth is what happened. That's as, as much as we're going to delve into that, uh, that question. Now, a second approach to finding out the Jewish past is what you might call anecdote or family legend, or, you know, well, I, I, you know, my relatives going back eight generations were rabbis on both sides and they lived in this town and they did this job. Did it really happen that way? Maybe. Maybe not. There's a really fascinating episode described in Dara Horn's uh, People of Je Dead Jews, um, where she talks about the story of the Ellis Island clerk who changed people's names mm. on the way in. How they showed up and the clerk misunderstood what they were saying or mistranslated it and wrote their name down wrong. And that's how they got the name Brown instead of Brunschweig or whatever their family name was in Europe. And what Horn points out and what historians have discovered is that in fact, that's almost never the case. First of all, it's not like Yiddish was an unknown language in New York in 1910. I mean, <laughs> there were lots of native Yiddish speakers there and they hired them to be there as translators. In fact, you couldn't get a job working in the Ellis Island clerkdom unless you spoke multiple languages, you know, the, uh, and they had translators available to, to explain these things. And it turns out if you look at the court records of name changes or people went to court to legally change their name, there's a surprisingly large number of Jewish families that did so. And they did so giving reasons like, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not accepted or I'm facing social discrimination or, or other euphemisms for that kind of experience. And so rather than tell the real story of what really happened of I faced prejudice in this wonderful country, or I wasn't able to get past this barrier without changing who I was. I had to take the ax to my own name to have the opportunity for you that I couldn't give you otherwise. I cut off my own roots 
it's easier to blame that nameless clerk at Ellis Island. Um, and so this is that challenging part about the an anecdote, the family legend, is that sometimes it's just not true. I mean, you, you hear stories all the time, people go get a DNA test and they find out that they are a surprisingly large chunk of something that doesn't fit with any of the family stories, right? Mm. You know, uh, I was told that I was, you know, descended from Africans on both sides and I have 35% white DNA, you know, a European white DNA. Where did that come? How did that come? It's in there somewhere, you know, but uh, it, the family legends didn't cover enough of it. Yeah, my mother had several stories that she used to tell me and uh, uh, they turned out to be, you know, I discovered that they weren't true, you know, um, and she had one in particular where my grandfather was in the Oregon Naval Militia in 1912 to 1916 and supposedly he was hosing down a deck and there was a chief petty officer who was a real pain in the neck and he called him a square head which is a bad name for a suite and and my grandfather who was a very placid man apparently got really angry and blew him off the deck with the hose and was discharged from the navy mm -hmm. well then i found all the new papers after everybody died and i have all the papers he was a chief petty officer himself he was honorably discharged and at the end of his service none of that apparently happened Maybe it happened to somebody else and he told her that story, who knows, but it certainly didn't happen to him. So, and, and there were some other stories like that too, where we're like, I just discovered that, no, that was, that didn't happen that way. Yeah. Which is interesting. My family changed its name when I first came over here too. And the story we always got is that he wanted to, that the guy that changed it, wanted, this was before Ellis Island, mm -hmm. um, well, wanted, before Ellis Island. wanted to have a name that was more American. So it mm -hmm. comes up with Wegley which no one can pronounce and no one can spell. <laughs> I mean, that's not in the family. Right, right. It, it was Wegerline, and we know that because we have deeds and things that he signed with both names so that people knew who he was. Right. Um, so, but th this is that, that yeah, challenge of exactly, yeah. the family story, the anecdote, yeah. and then you just extend that by generations. And there are people, by the way, who do use that as justification for traditional beliefs. They'll say, and you, you hear this all the time, this is an argument that goes back to the 900s when a Jewish philosopher named Yehuda Halevi wrote a book called the Kuzari, which describes how a rabbi uh, convinced the Khazar kingdom to become Jewish. Uh, but it's a whole philosophical book of arguments about why Judaism is true. And one of the arguments is 600,000 men saw the Torah get revealed on Mount Sinai. And then they passed down word of mouth of that experience over all these generations and would they lie to you? <laughs> you know, I mean, how could they how could they pass it off? How could they make it up and have anyone believe it if it hadn't actually happened that way? Six hundred thousand. That's always an amazing number to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, not to mention the fact that there are other stories of mass revelation in other traditions, yeah. like loaves and fishes. You ever hear that story? Oh, yeah. Right. Uh, walking on water, uh, Sermon on the Mount. I mean, the whole point of the Gospels is testimony, right, right, of what was done. Uh, and in the Aztec tradition, I think there was a mass revelation of one of the gods at one point. So it, it's not unique to Judaism to do that, even though the Kuzari claims so, claims that's the case. Um, but the other point to keep in mind is that in this era, the concept was that the further back you go with your pedigree for the story, the more reliable it is. So in the Talmud, you hear hmm. Rabbi so-and-so heard from Rabbi so-and-so heard yeah, from Rabbi so-and-so, yeah. and the further back you go, the more reliable it is. The same is true in the Islamic Hadith traditions, where right. the further back you can trace the lineage of the story about Muhammad, the more believable it is. And there's a whole school of Hadith criticism oh, yeah. that clarifies what's more and less believable. But in our day, we used, I remember when I was in summer camp, we played a game called Telephone. Mm -hmm. The game of Telephone, you sit in a circle, and one person says something to the person next to him, and then it gets said to the person next to him, and then next to them, all the way around the circle. And by the time the last person says what they've heard, it's very different from what the first person said. So for us, the further back it goes, the less likely we are to believe it, and the more likely we are to believe that, yes, someone could put this over on somebody or have an authority figure get up and say, this is what happened, and it may not have been exactly that way at all. So this is, again, a case where we critique this family legend passing down word of mouth approach as a source for accurate history. So in the end, what we're left with, if we're not going to rely on what the tradition says and what the book says, and we're not going to rely on the legends our parents, grandparents, and whatever passed down to us, we have to do what we call scholarship. 
We have to investigate. We have to look for evidence, uh, written, archaeological, material, context of other cultures and what's going on there, what do their accounts have to say, and then make our best guess, uh, which is going to be somewhat partial, it's going to be limited, it's going to often have conflicting perspectives included in it, but it's going to be our best guess reconstruction of what reality is. And you may recall from our earlier classes, we talked about finding the truth. We said that that's, that's how we find all kinds of truth. You know, you, you have that proverbial uh, blind people touching an elephant and mm -hmm. there's only a few of them. They think one is a, one thinks an elephant is like a hose and one thinks an elephant is like a fan and one thinks an elephant is like a rope and one thinks an elephant is like, it's like a tree trunk. But as I said at the time, uh, if you have a thousand people and a very patient elephant, <laughs> uh, and a very large elephant, <laughs> and then, you know enough space, you can approximate what the elephant is by multiple perspectives and experience. So the more evidence we have to find out what happened in the past, the more confidence we can have in saying this is most likely what happened. And also we can say this other version is very unlikely to have happened. Um, one example of how this played out in biblical archaeology was um, the sort of dean of biblical archaeology was a man named William F. Albright. Yeah. yeah. And he supposedly would go out digging with a Bible in one hand and his spade in the other, because his goal was to find this in the dirt, right? Uh, in fact, he called the field biblical archaeology. The problem was that he found places like Jericho, but when later generations checked his dating, <laughs> They realized that he dated it wrong, or in any case, the, the end result of Jericho was that Jericho itself was totally empty in the days when Joshua supposedly would have been there. It was inhabited in 1500 BCE, it was inhabited around 1000 BCE, it was largely vacant around 1200 BCE, which is the most plausible dating time for Joshua and the conquest of the land. Uh, now the city of Ai, which is nearby, was burned. There's a layer of ash around 1200 BCE. So maybe they just mixed up Jericho and Ai, um, and that's plausible. But the reality is that uh, Albright's claim that the, the spade had found the Bible simply didn't wash when you looked at the evidence more carefully. Um, and this can be controversial. Uh, as I point out in uh, talking about our, our Jewish history class, which we'll be doing next year, um, if you did deep, careful archival research and you studied all the extant sources and you came to the conclusion that there were only 5 million Jews killed during the Holocaust instead of 6 million Jews, what would be the result of publishing? Well, you'd get a lot of people being upset with You would get a lot of people very mad. How dare you? Who are you? Uh, you know, what's your agenda? This yeah. couldn't possibly be true. So it's not just ancient history that gets controversial. There are elements of modern history. I mean, honestly, look at what's going on right now in the United States over what's pejoratively called critical race theory, um, which is looking at um, American history through the lens of race, slavery, discrimination, and so on. Um, and it's a, it's a compelling view. It's not the only view through which to view it. You can do it economically, you can do it uh, from a lot of uh, feminist perspective, right, is an equally legitimate approach. But it's an interesting lens through which to view it. And part of the point is that history doesn't exist to make you comfortable. <laughs> no. History is what it was. And often it's going to make you uncomfortable. Well, some people but, think it should make you comfortable. Well, that's, that's the yeah. usable past. Yeah. That's well, taking what you want. That's the Ron DeSantis approach. But, but, but also people conflate history with myth. So that, so for example, you know, the, the cherry tree and the dollar across the you know, Potomac and, you know, the variety, the whole lot of things. These are founding myths, which we accept because it says something about the founders, which says something about the quality of our society. And, and, every, and every society has sure. these kinds of myths. You know, so, you know, if you have a Moses and you have an Aaron, you have people like this, you know, these are the people that were good and that this is why we are where we are. And it justifies an existing order very often. And what happens very often, as you well know, is they go back and they take pieces out that no longer are relevant to what you want to justify now. Right. That's right. Yeah, Cindy, please. Um, one of the things that's worth remembering, too, is how um, how limited our understandings are based on the perspective and the knowledge of the person sort of doing their research or the discovery. Um, 
some of the things I've seen recently, um, you know, they, they find tools in places and they don't know what they're for. And there's all sorts of speculation and it's kind of this default um, position to say, oh, well, it, it was a, a religious artifact. It must be, a, you know, we don't know what it's for. So it's that. And then, you know, a, a local artisan sees it, an indigenous person sees it, it's like, no, it's, you know, this thing for making baskets or it's this thing for, you know, working with leather or what have you. Um, there was a whole big talk for quite a while about how um, Greek women in, you know, the, the age of antiquity, how they managed such complicated hairstyles. And, you know, they're, they're shown as having these elaborate things and how could they do that? They didn't have Aquanet and, you know, everything else. And then finally somebody thought, well, maybe we should ask a hairdresser. And the hairdressers went, well, they sewed it together. There are places now where you sew your, your hairstyle in place. And, you know, that's just what you do. But for how many years, all of these, you know, commonly men, commonly, you know, Western educated um, people were, were just limited because they didn't have the perspective needed to really make it, you know, a, a true assessment of what was in front of them. Sure. I mean, if you found an artifact with 28 notches on a piece of wood, some people might say, is there a sacred number or is that counting? And someone else will say, they're counting their period. I mean, it's, <laughs> this is not rocket science, but your perspective makes a big difference in how you read the evidence. Um, so yes, it's absolutely true. Um, ideally, the more perspectives you get on the same topic, uh, the closer you can approximate some kind of truth, or you have a multivocal truth that offers many perspectives on one object. After all, you wouldn't describe a sculpture from only one view. You have to walk around it and yeah. get the other views of it, and then you can describe it, but it's never going to be the same from one angle or, or the other. Well, there's also a, a, a group of, um, I don't know if they're archaeologists, but that have, you know, tried to recreate the tools and things. Right. And, and you said, like, well, this is how it's, you know, what we thought had happened, you can't do it that way. And we're, and we were recreating it by trying to make it. Right, and, right. And that, flint, flint and napping and all kinds there of There are all things. kinds of ways to analyze tools now, yeah, too, to yeah. find out where the wear is on it. Right, right. You can tell how it was held because it has a different kind of wear from where Right, but, absolutely. I mean, and, and actually some archaeologists now are starting to use what they call native informants to help them when they're doing things, you know, to, right. to make suggestions like that. Like, yeah, ask the Napa well, you know. <laughs> and, and one of the one of the quirky details is that sometimes we know more about what existed in a particular location 300 years before and a later civilization than that later civilization did, because it was just a mound to them. But we've done the ground penetrating radar, yeah, we've yeah. done the excavation, so we actually have a better sense of the history than the people living it of what happened before them sometimes because of the tools that we have. So that's how we find the information, right? Now, what do we do with it? <laughs> what effect does it have on how we uh, practice Judaism? Do we teach it in our Sunday schools? Does it affect our philosophy? After all, if we don't see Jewish history as a story of miracle after miracle delivering the Jewish people, and rather it's a product of human effort, then maybe our philosophy shifts from asking for miracles to relying on human self-reliance. I will say there, there are passages in the Talmud that say, we don't rely on a miracle. You know, don't just sit there and pray, do something. <laughs> uh, so it isn't a purely, you know, pious uh, interventionist approach, uh, but still there's a sense of um, providence and divine planning and, uh, and care for those who are pious and so on. Uh, or the idea that tzedakah saves from death. You know, if you do righteousness and charity, it will help you. Um, well, so maybe our lessons are a little bit different out of that. So to take a look at one example of this, um, I'm going to show you a few slides that talk about what are the implications if you accept that people wrote the Torah, which is a historical conclusion. And there's a lot of evidence for that based on sources and critical study and comparing other literatures and, and so on. We're not going to get into the details of that today, but I want to think through what are some of the implications of if the Torah is written by people. Now, I will also point out, I just want to pin me so that uh, that's what's visible. There we go. Um, I will point out that uh, there are plenty of arguments that 
a, a god wrote the Torah, part of Jewish tradition. Uh, for example, uh, if I can get the slide to advance, there we go. Here's a passage in uh, the Mishnah, first collection of rabbinic sayings. It says that all of Israel have a portion of the world to come, but these are the ones that do not have a portion in the world to come. Someone who says that resurrection, resurrection of the dead is not in the Bible. Um, it isn't, by the way. No, it isn't, yeah. <laughs> it literally it says, min uh, Torah, and that is from the first five books. There is a resurrection story in Daniel at the very end of the Hebrew right. Bible, the last, one of the last canonized books, but in the Torah itself, there is no afterlife, clearly. Uh, certainly not a resurrection of the dead. Um, secondly, that the Torah is not from heaven, divinely revealed. And the third is an apicorus, a, a heretic. You know, think Epicurus in his critical philosophy. So these are the categories of people in Israel, or Israelites, who do not have a share in the world to come. The first one makes sense. If you don't believe in a world to come, you shouldn't get, shouldn't get an entry <laughs> ticket, right? Um, but the second is a, a core belief that the Torah is from heaven, that is divinely authored. It has a divine origin. In fact, it becomes even mechanical in the Talmud, the story written maybe another couple hundred years later, describes Moses going up on Mount Sinai, and he saw, this is Kadosh Baruch Hu, which means the Holy One, blessed be he, sitting, tying crowns on the Torah's letters. He's actually finalizing the font that they're using <laughs> to write the Torah. And Moses said, why aren't you just giving it as it is? Why are you adding this flourish on these letters? And God says, well, there's a man after several generations, Akiva ben Yosef is his name, he will derive from every point of these crowns, mounds and mounds of halachot, of Jewish laws. So the idea of God mechanically sitting down and physically writing out the scroll and putting the crowns on the letters is part of the traditional mythology. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, a few centuries later, when Maimonides writes his 13 principles of faith, uh, which are what every educated Jew should believe, number eight is, I believe with perfect faith that all of the Torah that we now have is the same one that was given to Moses, our rabbi, or our teacher, uh, peace be upon him. So the entire Torah we have now is the same that was given to Moses. And given to Moses by whom? Not by the Time Life Company, <laughs> <laughs> you know, not by a neighboring a bookseller, by God. And this is also reflected in the liturgy when a Torah is taken out from the Ark. This is the traditional blessing on the taking out of the Torah. Blessed are you, our God, sovereign of the universe, who has chosen us from all the people and given us his Torah. Blessed are you, God, notena Torah, who gives the Torah. So again, it's his Torah. He gave, it's clearly divine authorship. Similarly, when the Torah is put back, let me just finish this yeah, one. Sure. Um, it's said in, uh, this is the Torah that Moses placed before the children of Israel by the mouth of God in the hand of Moses. And this is recited, by the way, in Orthodox, conservative, and reform temples, synagogues, congregations. The same blessings, taking it out and putting it back, that are affirming divine authorship of the entire Torah. Sorry, Kathy, you were going to... Oh, no, I just forgot something I think you already told us. When did the Torah appear, or is that what you would say? It was finalized most likely around 500 BCE. Um, it's actually most likely the Torah that Ezra, the priest, brought back from Babylonian exile. And they had compiled it into its final form around that time period, oh, so which would be another 700 years after Moses supposedly lived. So Moses had a, like an unedited form and they just worked on it all that time? Or? Well, the claim here is that Moses had the perfect form and it's always been the same all the way through. It never changed. Oh, there. but they only brought it out in 700 BCE? No, no, no. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm we're, we're, switching, we're switching modes of thinking here. Oh, the traditional okay. perspective is, that's reflected in these blessings, is that Moses received the entire Torah, including the part that talks about his death at the end of Deuteronomy. Moses got the entire Torah and it was passed down perfectly, exactly the same way, uh, with hand copying for all these generations until right now. That's the traditional perspective. That's that believing the old story. So they don't pay any attention to Ezra. Yeah, I mean Ezra is important because he like reestablishes the Torah's authority but when he he's back from exile. Written any of but it's not claimed to have okay. written it. That's the historian's perspective that gotcha. thinks he, he compiled the final version of it. I was confused about that. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's hard to like shift uh, vocabularies there. Is the, is the Exodus, the, does the story of the Exodus 
important before the exile, particularly, or we just don't really can't it's, tell. It's hard to, the, I mean, it obviously becomes more important during the exile right. because there's a prefiguration right. yeah. of what's going to happen. But um, I, I, there was some, I think there was some kind of exodus before that. Don't forget the Northern Kingdom of Israel was exiled That's in 722, yeah, you yeah. know, much earlier. Yeah. So it's plausible that that might have been a, a, a starting point for that story. Okay, so now if you decided instead it was written just by people, there are a number of implications and consequences to that. If it was written just by people instead of by a God, then the challenging passages are no longer a dilemma. You know, if God wrote it and then he talks about slavery and talks about stoning rebellious children and all these terrible passages, it, you're, you're sort of, told, this is eternally true? Yeah. Well, once people wrote it, oh, okay. So if it says, when you acquire a Hebrew slave, he's sort of sixth year, the seventh year he goes free. If he's single, he can come leave single. If he has a wife, his wife leaves with him. But if his master gave him a wife and born him children, the wife and her children belong to the master and he leaves alone. That's sort of sad. That's awful. <laughs> and if the slave declares, I love my master, my wife and my children, I do not wish to go free, then the master takes him before God. He's brought to the door or the doorpost and his master pierces his ear with an awl and he remains a slave for life. Blech. Blech. And if a man strikes his slave with a rod and he dies then and there, he must be avenged. But if the slave survives a day or two, he is not to be avenged since he is the other's property. Yeah, and this Chattel, is the, And this is the kind of stuff that the Southern preachers used to sure. you know, say, hey. Even, even some Southern rabbis used it to justify yeah. slavery. Uh, so the point is, is this eternally true? Is this beautiful? Is this, no, this is a product of its time and its place. And so it's important to remember that if you think of values as like a Venn diagram, there's going to be Torah values, what the Torah represents. There's going to be our values living in the 21st century. And there'll be times they overlap, you know, love the stranger as yourself, do not oppress the worker and withhold his wages, um, care for the widow and the orphan, uh, you know, leave the gleanings of the field for those who need it. There's wonderful ethics in there. That's in that A and B part, because it's my ethics and it's Torah ethics. But an example like the slavery thing is that's Torah values, but not my values because it was written, you know, 1500, 2000, 2500 years ago. I shouldn't expect to agree with everything in it, but that's, that's a wonderful consequence of it being written by people, having that historical approach. I don't have to defend everything. I'm allowed to say, thank goodness this is old. A second difference is that if it's written by just people and it has a historical context, and there's a distinction between the Torah itself and the traditional comments on the Torah. So this is an example of how you might actually read a text from the Torah in a traditional setting. It's called the Mikraot Gedalot, the large scriptures, because it includes the main text of the Torah and then all the commentaries around it to tell you what it actually means or how you should think about it or other legends that have been added into it but are now so canonical that you can't read this story without that lens. There's a famous example of a, um, a legend about Abraham that says that his father, Terah, was an idol maker, made statues to worship. And he left Abraham as his um, watchman in the shop one night. And Abraham had received a revelation that you weren't supposed to worship idols anymore. And so he took a hammer and he smashed all of the statues except for one. And he left the hammer leaning against that statue. His father comes in in the morning and says, what happened here? I thought you were supposed to watch this. And he said, well, I did. But the problem is that they got into an argument over which God was the most important. And so that one over there picked up a hammer and smashed all the other ones. And, and that's what happened. This God said, and his, brother says, his father says, that's ridiculous. These are just statues made out of stone. I carved them yesterday. They can't do anything. And Abraham says, aha, <laughs> do you get the lesson? <laughs> now, this is not anywhere in the Hebrew Bible. No. I this is a rabbinic yeah. legend that's added later. But if you were reading a Mikra Ot version, it would have that story there because that's the lens through which you're supposed to view the Abraham saga. So in that world, there is no distinction between the Torah and Torah commentary. So people will say he teaches wonderful Torah or when they read the Talmud, they say they're reading Torah because it's sort of an extension of that legal principle or discussions where we would say if it's written in a particular time in a particular place by people, then there's the book. And then there's the books about the book that are written in their time and place. And, that, you know, you never get out of your time and place. You know, Rashi writes in medieval France, actually in the Rhine Valley, sort of between France and Germany. 
Um, but he's a product of his time and place. He is not perfect and eternally true. And the same is true for this modern version, which was published in the 19, uh, early 2000s, called a women's Torah commentary. And they call it a women's commentary because they don't want to speak for all women and say the women's Torah commentary. That was actually an editorial decision. Uh, but it collects a lot of different women's voices that now are also on the page, but again, coming out of their time and place and clearly marked as different from the main text. And then you could even have a creative retelling of the story like Anita Diamant's The Red Tent, which is sort of a creative uh, revisioning of the Dina story in the book of Genesis, uh, but from a very feminist perspective, if you uh, have a chance to read it. Another example of an implication is that the 70 faces of the Torah that are traditionally interpreted there are our faces. That is, it was thought that if you can read the same text multiple ways, God planned all of it. Because if he wrote it, then he can put whatever meanings he wants in there. But if we wrote it, if people wrote it, and people are reading it, you can use what's called reader, reader's response theory, reader response theory, and maybe different people are going to read it differently. But it's literature. So if God's a character, then if God gets mad, or God gets jealous, or God needs psychological manipulation to do the right thing, that's okay, because it's not God, it's the character, Yahweh the God, like Zeus. In the mythology. This particular story is one of my favorites, where the people of Israel have made the golden calf. Mm -hmm. And God says, Do you see what your people have done? You know, like parents who are you know, your, your, your son. Your son, right? Yeah. And so then God says to Moses, Let me be, leave me alone, and let me go wipe them out. And Moses implores God, saying, Don't let your anger blaze against your people. Notice he uses the your back to God to get him to identify with them, whom you delivered. Do, did you want to waste your time? Because you, I mean, you, you did take a lot of energy to do that. And what are the Egyptians going to say if they hear you did this? Let not the Egyptians say it's with evil intent to deliver them, to kill them off in the mountains. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. You know, even if you don't like their kids, <laughs> for their sake, maybe. And remember how you swore to them by your own self. You want to use your name in vain? You... You promised by your own sense of value that you would preserve their people and bring them into the land. And so then Yahweh renounces the punishment. So you have the manipulation of ego and reputation and uh, consistency of your promises and a call for attachment. And I mean, it's wonderfully psychological. It's like the anger management therapist, you know, yeah, who's, really is. who's trying to address them. Again, if it's God, you don't do that to a God. But if it's a character, then it's totally fine. And that's, that's one of the benefits of taking that secular scholarly approach. Um, and if it's written in a particular time of place, then it's a product of the genius or the mishigas, the silliness of the Jewish people. Um, and this is a, a quote from an American reform rabbi who loved the idea of the modern, modern critical Bible. He said, it's restored the Bible to us. If the Bible came down from the clouds as no other book has, it's not our own. The Bible is ours. We wrote it. <laughs> it's the literature of a highly gifted people. So it's actually not a Jewish book if the God wrote it. It becomes a Jewish book if the Jewish people wrote it. And then, then we have the implications of when, when, when does this knowledge apply? This is about the Torah, but we could talk about any of these historical critical details. At what age do you tell them the real story? How much detail do you bring into this? And how do you maintain that balance of here's the story and here's the history and they're both important in in their own way at what age does that make sense do you treat the torah scroll differently are you going to parade it around and kiss it if you realize it was written by people or do you still do that for the tradition's sake does the torah belong in a library instead of in an ark or maybe other books written by people can go in an ark because they're also written by people and are also important to us do we adjust the liturgy. Instead of saying, this is the Torah that Moses plays, you know, all those reform rabbis and all those conservative rabbis who are saying that every week, they learned in rabbinical school that this is not the Torah that Moses plays, that there probably was no Torah that Moses plays, that that's a, a later legend. But they're still saying it. So maybe you decide that the truth matters and I want to say what's true and maybe you write something new that says, this is the Torah that Ezra compiled from multiple sources and maybe that doesn't work as well. It's not as poetic. Maybe you can shift it to something like, blessed are you Israel that gives the Torah, because we wrote it. 
So that's what that says in Hebrew. Baruch Atah Yisrael, no ten HaTorah, instead of God. Maybe it's Israel that gives the Torah. And then finally, what does this do to your theology? <laughs> if you accept that God didn't write this text, it's not really scripture in the same sense, then you know, maybe um, it's going to shift your sense of what a God is or isn't, and uh, its understanding in Jewish history too. So this is just one sort of applied example of how the uh, history um, understood as a human process can really change our understanding of uh, Jewish life and might affect all kinds of different areas. And so the last of those three questions I want to do just briefly, because I've gone on quite a bit in this early material, uh, is the question of the meanings of Jewish history or lessons from Jewish history. Um, one of the classic lessons of Jewish history is that the Jews are the chosen people. They are the central attention of this God, who's the God of all the universe, and if they do well, they'll prosper, and if they break this God's commandments, they will suffer. In fact, he will bring other nations to conquer them. It's not that the Babylonians did it on their own, Yahweh wanted to use them. He, they were the club. They were the, the rod that he was not sparing to spoil the child, and that's why they suffered. But you could read the same history very differently. There's a marvelous passage in the book of Jeremiah. That uh, Jeremiah is a prophet who works in Jerusalem, but then he uh, moves down into Egypt. And uh, in Egypt, he um, has a bunch of exiles gathered with him there. Uh, and he says to them, God has punished you. That's why you've had to leave after the temple was destroyed. And thereupon, this is the pushback from the people. Thereupon they answered Jeremiah, all the men who knew their wives made offerings to other gods, all the women present, a large gathering, all the people living in Pathros in the land of Egypt. We will not listen to you and the matter about which you spoke to us in the name of Yahweh. On the contrary, we will do everything that we vowed, to make offerings to the queen of heaven and pour out libations to her as we used to do. Our, we and our fathers, our kings and our officials in the towns of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem. For then we had plenty to eat. We were well off, we suffered no misfortune. But ever since we stopped making offerings to the queen of heaven and pouring libations out to her, we have lacked everything. We've been consumed by sword and by famine. They were living in Jerusalem for a long time. They were worshiping many gods, the queen of heaven, and then they were told to stop by the prophets, and they stopped, and then they were destroyed. So why did that happen? According to Jeremiah, they were being punished for all those years of worshiping the Queen of Heaven. But according to these people, it was the Queen of Heaven who got mad, <laughs> that they stopped worshiping her, and look what happened. So we're going back, we're going to do exactly what we used to do with her, and when we make offering to the Queen of Heaven and pour out libations, is it without our husband's approval? Of course, the women are doing it with their husband's approval. Now, Jeremiah responds, and he says, indeed, the offerings you presented in the towns of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem were remembered by Yahweh and brought to mind. When you could no longer bear your practices and the abominations you committed, your land became a desolate ruin, as is still the case. So it's the same history, right? The same event happened, Jerusalem was destroyed. And Jeremiah reads it one way to confirm what he believes, that Yahweh is the only God to be worshipped. And the worshippers of the Queen of Heaven read it exactly the opposite way, that they should have kept worshipping the Queen of Heaven and not shifted to just worshipping um, Yahweh. So we're going to, uh, in our discussion questions, talk a little bit more about this chosen people question. But uh, the last point I want to make about Jewish history and why this is important for secular humanistic Jews specifically is that this counts as doing Jewish for us, learning about our past, finding out what our people really did. This is Jewish practice. It's not only going to synagogue and lighting Shabbat candles and eating matzah and holding a Passover Seder and having Hanukkah candles and so on. This counts as Jewish practice too, learning about the history of our people. When I was in college, I almost never went to Hillel. And uh, somebody asked me, you know, you're thinking of being a rabbi, why don't you ever go to Hillel? And I said, well, I'm majoring in Jewish studies. I'm taking four religious studies classes in Hebrew this particular semester. Like, I'm Jewed out. <laughs> At a certain point, you know, I'm, I'm studying Hebrew, I'm learning Jewish, I'm doing all this Jewish content all week long. And so, you know, maybe I'll go for a debate team tournament this weekend or I'll, you know, go to a concert or something else. Because, but the point was that doing my homework studying Jewish history and thought and philosophy, that was Jewish practice too. Not just going to Hillel and having a Shabbat dinner. 
So uh, that's why this is an important topic. That's why we have a whole year on Jewish history in our adult education curriculum. Um, it's an important part of uh, our approach to Jewish identity.